So my name is Kurt Miller. I'm an OpenBSD developer, and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, implementing Pi on OpenBSD. Um, Pi is not that. Um, Pi stands for Position Independent Executable, and um, what it is is when you compile your executable itself to be position independent, and when you combine that with some, some kernel support, uh, you can then move that around. Uh, so it's another address space randomization uh, or address space layout randomization uh, technique. And um, it's a uh, exploit mitigation um, uh, feature. And the way it works uh, to, to get started is to really just do a little uh, quick summary of um, the uh, traditional process layout for a static program, uh, starting at the uh, low addresses here uh, up to high addresses. The, the, when you compile a, a typical program, it's, it's uh, linked at a fixed address. So every time that you execute it, it's loaded uh, at a low address. Uh, starting with the code in the text segment, the initialized data, the uninitialized data, and then the heap uh, following directly after the uh, uninitialized data. Uh, and then starting from the other end of the uh, address space, uh, there's area reserved for the stack, and on, on most architectures, that as it grows, it grows down. The space in between is uh, utilized for uh, MMAP, um, which you can uh, use for mapping files uh, and uh, Either you know anonymous or uh, shared. Um, let's see. So when you add in shared libraries to this, um, I sort of squish stuff down here. Uh, but you have your uh, executable, your heap here, and then the uh, kernel loads the runtime linker in into memory, which lands directly after the heap. Uh, and then the runtime linker goes ahead and loads the shared libraries that the uh, dynamically linked uh, application has linked to in the order that they were linked. So they just stack up in memory uh, uh, directly after the runtime linker. Um, so what you end up having is a uh, sort of predictable layout uh, for a given program. Uh, every time that you execute it, you're going to uh, essentially get the, starting with your fixed address at the link, uh, all the way up through with all of your shared libraries, um, the same layout. Uh, so this uh, predictability is something that can be exploited by a uh, uh, exploit technique called return to libc. And <clears throat> if you uh, think about the stack as, it's, as, it, as it grows downward, and you call into a function, the parameters are pushed on the stack, the return address, the uh, base pointer, and then space is reserved for your local variables. So if you have a, a network daemon uh, calls a function that deals with some uh, user controlled data and copies it into a buffer, and there's a bug there where it doesn't control the size of that buffer, you can uh, overwrite your stack with uh, bad stuff. Um, so your traditional buffer overflow would put executable code right on the stack uh, and in the, in the place of the return address point to that uh, shell code um, and when the uh, program returned from the function instead of returning back to where it was called from it would end up running the shell code. Um, so uh, along the way um, the stack became not executable so that attack would not work. And the return to C, uh, return to libc attack was devised to get around the um, uh, the idea that the stack is no longer executable. Uh, and, and in this attack, because of the predictability of the layout of the uh, program, you can know where in libc certain uh, functions are, like the system call. Uh, and so instead of uh, writing code onto the stack you overwrite your uh, return address with the address of the system call and then continue on and, and place the parameters that you want that function to execute. Uh, and again, when, when this returns, it ends up executing this. So this takes advantage of the fact that the, uh, the predictability of where things are going to lie for a given program. So OpenBSD currently has some address-based uh, layout ra randomization techniques uh, built into it. Uh, and the way uh, they work, essentially, is that the kernel randomly loads uh, the runtime linker uh, into uh, area memory. Um, 
and then it goes ahead and inspects the uh, program and loads the shared libraries that it's linked to in random locations as, as well. So all the shared libraries, every time that you execute it, move around. And that, that prevents uh, the most common return to libc attack, which is going in and finding one of the uh, you know, exploitable uh, functions in libc. However, the main program is still linked at a uh, fixed address, and you can use the return to libc attack if you're able to get past pro release um, uh, to call into functions in the main program. So uh, supposing that you could, you could pull off a, uh, a buffer overflow and guess the canary to get past the uh, pro release uh, stack protection, uh, you could then try to exploit a function within the main program itself. So what Pi adds is the ability to move this around as well. And, um, however, in order to do that, um, you now have to compile your, your program as a position independent, uh, you know, as position independent objects, which changes the nature of um, some of the, the uh, code. Uh, it has to take less efficient uh, paths to get to symbols and <clears throat> you also lose uh, a, a, a register to uh, maintain the uh, got table address. Um, now, uh, I386 is different um, because it does not have the ability to uh, set individual pages to be uh, no execute. Um, at least the, the you know, majority of the processors out there uh, have, have this problem. And um, Currently in OpenBSD, the, the technique to get around uh, or to work with that uh, is that you do have the ability to sort of draw a line in the sand in your um, memory space and say everything below it is uh, executable where everything above it is not. Um, so if you take a look at um, this, what we've, what we've done with the address space for um, WXRX is uh, the main program is, is split up into its uh, code and data with a 512 gap. Uh, and this leaves, uh, and, and the, uh, the program is loaded at uh, below this line at uh, 448 megabytes, which is 64 meg below the, uh, uh, the exact line, um, and that's the, the maximum size of it, the text segment. Uh, so by leaving this big, these big gaps here, when you load in your shared libraries, uh, they, they also will have uh, gaps. They can load in down here uh, with their text segment and their data segment at a 512 gap above, and therefore, all your, your code is below the line, and um, the data and the stack and so forth are above. Um, so trying to implement Pi on I386, uh, we had to find a, a, a space within uh, uh, that we could use, an area that we can use to randomize the load of the, the main program. Uh, so taking a look at our existing scheme, um, what we saw was that uh, Shared libraries, the maximum random address that they would load at is 256, and the maximum text size is uh, 64 meg. So from 320 meg to 448, there was an area of memory that was typically not utilized. Uh, so that's the area where, with Pi uh, on OpenBSD, it'll randomize the, uh, the load of the, the executable. And we chose that as opposed to moving up because um, as you move everything up, you reduce your MMAP space. So we didn't want to take away already tight MMAP space on OpenBSD. <clears throat> so um, implementing this uh, on OpenBSD, uh, sort of like the devil's in the details, the, the concepts are pretty easy, but it touched on a lot of areas from the compiler, linker, the kernel, you know, all the areas that I've uh, hit upon here in this little pie. Uh, and as typical in OpenBSD, we, we tend to take our time developing our features, partly because it's you know open source and, and, and people are doing it uh, in their free time, but also because uh, as you're making systematic changes, you'd like to have the bugs sort of work their way out and uh, make sure that uh, as you're changing the kernel, uh, the way that ELF programs are, are loading, that it doesn't interfere with existing uh, applications. 
So uh, work started on this prior to the last release, uh, and it's still in progress, but uh, with the 5.5 release, you'll be able to use Pi with... 5.5? I'm sorry, 4.5. The the, the 4.5 release, uh, we will have all the... All dynamic programs will be able to utilize uh, Pi, but we're not going to turn it on uh, by default just yet. Uh, there's some more work to be done, and that's the goal, is to get this to be a uh, by-default uh, feature. Um, so if we step through each one of these areas that needed to be uh, enhanced, um, starting with the compiler, um, the uh, GCC 3.4 had introduced the uh, Pi flag, uh, and uh, I backboarded that to our the, the version that we're using, 3.3. Um, and what the Pi flag does is it's very similar to the PIC flag. So if you're familiar with PIC, it, it compiles your, uh, your program to be position independent. Um, but really, it's more than just position independent. It's, it's the object is really designed to, uh, to run within a shared library such that the symbols can be overridden uh, by other shared libraries or the main program itself. So it's it's position independent and it's also design, you know the pick flag really is more sh- really should be like shared like a shared flag for a shared library. What Pi does is the same thing. You get position independent, but the resulting object is only uh, able to be used in the executable itself because it's able to take advantage of the fact that uh, the symbols won't be overridden by another uh, object. Um, also, there are uh, with the with the pick flags. There's a small version and a large uh, small small pick and large pick. Depending on your architectures, a couple of architectures that gives you uh, the small pick will will allow for a smaller jump range, and the uh, large pick will produce larger and slower code for a larger range. Um, and the exact same thing we have for for Pi. So if we take a minute to look at the uh, optimization that uh, Pi brings over. Uh, uh, over PEC, um, take a look at a small program here with a, a single uh, global variable and uh, uh, global function that's in the same object file as, as the main program. And then take a look at the uh, uh, resulting assembly. So uh, comparing uh, the FPI output with the FPEC, um, you both of them end up using the uh, EDX regist- register. This is on x86. It's very similar on, on different architectures. Um, they both end up using an additional register to do the position independent work. Uh, however, with FPI, um, a function that is or a uh, yeah a function that is local to the uh, the current object, it knows that symbol can never be overridden, so it can directly access that uh, symbol. Whereas on um, on Pi, instead of being able to go directly uh, to the, the global function within the same object file, it has to jump through the PLT table, which is an intermediate table uh, that the uh, runtime linker can, can control exactly which function that goes to. Uh, so it's a, less, it's a less efficient call to go through the PLT uh, table than to go directly to a function. Uh, also, uh, if accessing the uh, local global variable uh, it can directly access it through an offset off the got here, whereas on a, in a, in a uh, shared library or FPIC, you have to go through two steps: uh, one to load the, the offset, a value, uh, a pointer, basically out of the uh, the got table, and then use that to indirectly add your uh, make your move. Um, so F, FPI is better than FPIC. But it's still uh, not as good as a fixed compile. When you fix compile, you have access to the EBX register. You don't know, here. You see it's not being used. So the the compiler can use the EBX register to uh, optimize the code. Has one additional register to work with. And the um, in this case, uh, basically these are direct references, but. Uh, uh, with FPI, if, if you're dealing with a symbol that's outside the, the object file, it could be coming from the shared library, so it has to use the, the slow uh, sort of pick method for getting it. So, uh, so now you've compiled your objects with FPI, uh, the linker needed to, to be aware of it, and fortunately, 
uh, our base system bin utils uh, already had Pi support, uh, and essentially all that needed to be done was going through the uh, linker scripts to include the 512 meg gap on I386 so that uh, uh, it would maintain the the uh, no execute setup that we have. So if you take a look at the the output of uh, the object dump output from a uh, program that's been linked with Pi versus a fixed uh, program, uh, you'll see that a fixed program has the exact P file flag and the uh, Pi uh, program has the dynamic file flag. The fixed program is linked at the fixed address, whereas the, the Pi program is linked at zero uh, and has the position independent objects in it. So what you end up with with a Pi program is something really close to a shared library. Um, and if we look at the object, compar object dump comparison, uh, the file flags show dynamic like, like a shared library. However, it has additional sections, uh, the program header section and the interpreter section. And these are important because you need a way, uh, the kernel needs a way to identify if a person is trying to execute a shared library or if they're trying to execute a, uh, uh, a Pi program and needs to be able to look at the ELF data to figure that out. Um, so that was one of the areas that we had to enhance. The kernel needed to be, become aware of, uh, you know, that you're running a Pi program and, and the combination of a dynamic file flag plus the interpreter section was, is, is sort of the key to the kernel to say, okay, this is a Pi program. Uh, now go ahead and randomize it, the, the load address into, uh, into memory. Um, so we created a function called uh, UVM map pi that uh, uh, essentially took a couple of uh, constants for each architecture and returned back a random load address for uh, the pi program. And then the auxiliary vector data that the kernel uh, sets up for uh, starting a process uh, had to be adjusted to include the offset that the uh, pi program was written at. So once the kernel's loaded this, it goes through a process of, of uh, you know, the steps of, of kicking off the program. So quickly review that um, with a static program. Uh, when you when you compile or link a static program, the the linker uh, goes ahead and adds a few uh, uh, C startup objects: uh, CRT0, uh, CRTBN, and CRTN. Um, and the kernel, when it begins execution of the process, it doesn't go directly to the main function of your, your program. It goes to the start symbol in the uh, CRT0. And typically C CRT0 is, um, has a bit of assembly that's architecture specific that fixes up the kernel's transition to user land for the beginning of a process and, and gets the arguments set up so that it's following the ABI <clears throat> for uh, and then it, go, it calls into uh, into the main function itself. So when you add in a dynamic program, uh, you still get the CSU objects linked in. Um, the kernel sets up the auxiliary vector data, which is essentially uh, information to the runtime linker on how to find the ELF data for the program that was just loaded and the start address of the program itself. Uh, and the kernel maps in LDSO, or the runtime linker, and transfers control to that before the CSU objects. And LDSO then has the ability to load all of the uh, shared libraries that it's been linked to. Um, and I, I go through the details of how it goes through that, but essentially when LDSO is finished, it then calls into uh, the, uh, the the start function in, in CRT0 and continues on like uh, a static program. So to get Pi uh, working for, for the, the startup of a process, uh, we needed to enhance LDSO uh, so that it could identify that the main uh, program needed to be re relocated as well. And uh, that was done by looking at the auxiliary vector data, which has the address of the P header uh, ELF structure. And, and then looking actually at the address that the uh, P header uh, data is uh, located at in the ELF, um, actually at in the ELF data, and take the difference between that to give the load offset that the kernel came up with. 
Uh, and once you have your load offset, you can then use that to relocate the whole, the main program. Um, also, all the CSU objects needed to be compiled to be position independent because uh, you need to be able to relocate the, uh, uh, the symbols with, that are within that, in those objects. Uh, and several architectures needed enhancement there. Um, yep. Yep. I'm oh, sorry. C startup? No. Source lib CSU. And then there's architecture specific um, uh, directories for, for the, the CRT0. Um, okay, so this is one of the areas that still needs works. Uh, static Pi programs are currently disabled. If, you, if you're using uh, OpenBSD current right now, you can, you can pr play with uh, Pi, but if you try to do a, a static Pi program, we've disabled it. And the reason why is because uh, when it was enabled and, and the initial features that came from uh, GCC and Binutils was that it, you got a, st a static program that needed the runtime linker to run. So it was not really fully static, and the um, runtime linker is not always guaranteed to be there, especially in, in single user mode. Um, user may not be uh, mounted, and so these programs couldn't run. Um, so there's, there's two solutions that we thought of for um, how to have static Pi programs work and not use LDSO to do the relocation. One is to, to build into um, the C startup objects the code to do the relocation for the program itself. Um, however, that approach means that every single static program is going to get a copy of the uh, relocation code in it, and you know, uh, expand the size of each of those, each one's, each each uh, program. Uh, and the other approach is to have to bring uh, some relocation code into the kernel. And I'm currently working on that. I'm, I'm uh, narrowing down the uh, runtime linker code to a. Uh, uh, the smallest possible bit of code that works, and then we'll look at uh, putting it in the kernel so that the kernel will relocate the static programs. Um, but that's definitely going to happen after the next release. Um, GDB. Um, out of the box, GDB does not understand Pi programs. However, some uh, a Red Hat employee uh, spent some time on getting it to work and left it in a branch of their tree and it never made it back into GDB. So I went through that branch and I extracted the, 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 uh, the support and then made some bug fixes and got it into our tree. Um, but it, Pi programs present an interesting problem for GDB because uh, with a typical fixed program, GDB knows where all the functions are going to be for your executable and can place breakpoints based on just the ELF data exactly at the addresses that it finds there. However, um, when you're, you attach to, let's say, a running Pi program with GDB, uh, that, those functions are all moved around now. So uh, additional uh, operation was added to the uh, ptrace uh, system call to uh, allow uh, GDB to find the augsv data, and then it can go through the same process that L LDSO went through to find the offset. Uh, the other thing it has to do is it has to defer breakpoints until after the program starts up so that it can go and find out where it ended up being loaded. Um, and the last thing, which is also in progress, is that there, our core file format does not include the uh, augsv data. So um, right now, a Pi program, if it cores, you can't use GDB to uh, debug it because it doesn't know where the functions all are. So uh, Mark Kittisons is working on, and there's a diff uh, out there for switching our core file format to ELF, which allows for the addition of a note uh, section that tells where the ELF data is. Um, so that, I'm not sure if that'll make, I'm not sure if this will make uh, the next release. It may come after. It's done, but it needs to, it's uh, architecture specific and needs to be tested on all the architectures, and I'm just not sure we're going to get all the testing done before things get locked down. Which is pretty quick. Um, start compiling now in two weeks. As <laughs> ours will be done Well, I would I would have started it this week, but uh, I'm here. So, uh, anyways, um, the end goal is to have this on by default, and there are a lot of steps still that need to be done to get there. Even though we're pretty close to having all the features done, there's still a, a bit to do before we can uh, turn this on. 
And, and you know, as OpenBSD tries to do is to have the security de uh, security options on all the time, and that's the goal. So that's where we're headed. Um, so what would happen essentially is that uh, when it's on by default, when you compile an object file, if it doesn't see f f uh, pick, it's going to assume that this is going into a program and compile it with f pipe. Uh, and when, when you link, unless it sees, you know, uh, dash shared for a shared library, it's going to assume that you're, you're linking a program and, and link it with uh, the dash pi. Uh, so there are some, some of the um, side effects of all this is that your, your code's going to be a little, sl little slower because you're, you've got to, uh, uh, you, lose, you lose a register. And uh, for the non-local globals, you still have to go through th sort of the slow method of finding your symbols. Um, and that generates also a little bit larger code. Um, however, that's, that's not such a big concern nowadays because uh, the majority of applications, and maybe I'm reaching in the statement, uh, tend to link in a lot of shared libraries for their functionality. So if, if your, your, your main executable is, is really calling a lot of shared libraries for its work, you're really not going to slow down much with Pi because the majority of your work is already position independent. It's only that, that little bit of code that's at the main executable that would be off uh, uh, and, and getting a little bit slower. Um, now, in different places in the, in the system, there's assembly you know, code uh, like the CSU objects and, and there's some other locations as well where uh, the assembly was handwritten and it wasn't PIC compatible. So those places will, will need to be identified and adjusted to be PIC compatible assembly, uh, or in, in certain cases, uh, you know, certain applications, we may choose to have pi off if, if the side effect of having, um, uh, of converting it to, to position independent is, is not desirable. No, uh, well, let me see. I, I compiled the whole ports tree with uh, for dynamic programs with Pi, and there was only a few uh, applications that didn't compile or complained, um, and I, I don't recall. It was like a few months ago. So, uh, but it was it was very promising as far as how much we were able to compile, uh, and and I've had the whole base system, all, all the dynamic programs, which is the majority of the system, uh, compiled with Pi and running that, and it, it runs you know runs fine. And I've tested this on a ton of architectures, which I have a list uh, on the next slide. But there are a couple of open questions. We have to figure out, you know, how much RAM disk growth. You know, OpenBSD likes to keep our install on a floppy, and, and it's majority of the, uh, if not all, I think, the uh, programs on the floppy are static. So uh, RAM disk growth might be an issue. Uh, and also, eventually, to measure the, the performance hit by switching everything to, to Pi. Um, and so some of the conclusions. Um, this approach helps prevent return to libc attacks. I and mean, we have other exploit mitigation techniques in like, like ProPolice that are supposed to detect when the uh, stack has been overwritten. Um, but having additional mechanisms is not a bad idea. I mean, you know, if, if, for example, there's a, a bug in ProPolice or someone figures out how to guess ProPolice's canary, or, you know, there, it's always good to have another layer of security that will catch this, or, or, or you know, instead of uh, having a, uh, you know, root exploit happen, the application crashes. Um, and because we already have some, you know, randomization in our shared libraries, we're really going to see the most value from Pi in our static programs where everything is linked into it. And you know, currently they're at a uh, fixed address. When you add pi, it'll move around. Um, but pi is not great for everything. And uh, forking daemon is one of the uh, particular uh, cases where it, you can still get through the, uh, uh, the, the pi uh, prevention. If you take a look at Apache 1.3, the way it's designed is the daemon starts up and then forks off its uh, copies of itself to deal with the clients. Well, each one of those uh, forked processes is an is exact copy of the initial program. So the initial program will get everything randomized, but each child is getting exact copy. So if you're an attacker, you can try a brute force a attack where you, you, every time that you, you attempt to, uh, to guess the address of the, you know, the system function, uh, the child crashes and the parent daemon starts another one. So 
you're, you have the ability to keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, and if you know it really becomes a, an administration issue, uh, issue at that point for uh, you know your administrator to to uh, detect when you know you have a lot of child processes crashing uh, that someone's trying to break in. Um, and the current status is that it works on all our GC th GCC three architectures. Um, except for ARM, which has some relocation bugs that prevent the, uh, uh, the executable from actually running well. Uh, and of course, I didn't do this all by myself. I had a lot of help along the way from, from Dale Ron, uh, Mark Kittisons, Toby, and Myron, um, who uh, you know, either participated in, in reviewing my diffs or testing my diffs or, or writing portions of this like, uh, like Mark has done. So if you have any questions, um, kind of Went through that fast. Yeah. It it varies by um, architecture. Um, there's two two things that you, you have the area which it randomizes into uh, helps you know define the number of bits. But um, there's also a, a an alignment consideration where uh, the the program uh, needs to be loaded at an aligned address. So even if you if you have a wide area of space. The alignment can take away, you know, a lot of the initial bits, and I, I did have a chart of it. Um, I think, well, like for Spark 64 and, and AMD 64, there there's like 20 something bits uh, of entropy. Uh, on i386, it's less. I, I think the number was 12. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it varies by architecture. On on the architectures that don't have like i386, you know the the memory layout that we have to separate the executable uh, segments from, from the data really squeezes our MMAP space. So it was, a, it was a, you know, one of the primary concerns with I386 was to be able to introduce this feature without uh, squeezing more of that space. So we really don't have a lot of area to, to map uh, randomly into. But on, on the other architectures that have the NX bit, you, and large address spaces like AMD 64 and, uh, and Spark 64, you know, I was able to use a, a very large area to randomize into. Any other questions? Oh, you know, one in the back. Um, I think I think it just comes down to the the, the architectures of the daemons, and uh, you know Apache has on, on 2x has a pre fork version, but I, I think in general people would tend to go towards the uh, the uh, the threaded version when we get our threads done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I'm not I'm not sure. If, I don't think it'll it'll spurn much difference uh, in in the way people design their their. Their code. Yes. Are there preliminary estimates for like what kind of is it that this like about? Actually, I have I've done none none of the uh, performance work on it. Um, there, there, you know, we have a, lar a large number of architectures, and to get uh, to get the testing done for all the steps that I went through on each architecture what took the majority of the time so far. So you know the sort of like uh, uh, Kurt uh, described, you know, focusing on getting it to work first, and then I'll, you know once I get the, the static uh, portion done, I'll go back and start you know looking at what what will it cost to turn everything on. Um, but I don't expect it to be too bad. Uh, you know, I three eighty six things are tight with the registers, but um, the other architecture should be okay. What's that? Here's a nine. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.